The reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 10, verses 5 to 27, and this can be found on page 694. God's judgment on Assyria. Woe to the Assyrian, the rod of my anger, in whose hand is the club of my wrath. I send him against a godless nation. I dispatch him against a people who anger me, to seize, loot and snatch plunder, and to trample them down like mud in the streets. But this is not what he intends. This is not what he has in mind. His purpose is to destroy, to put an end to many nations. Are not my commanders all kings, he says? Has not Kalno fared like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad, and Samaria like Damascus? As my hand seized the kingdoms of the idols, kingdoms whose images excelled like those of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not deal with Jerusalem and her images as I dealt with Samaria and her idols? When the Lord has finished all his work against Mount Zion and Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look in his eyes. For he says, by the strength of my hand I have done this, and by my wisdom, because I have understanding. I removed the boundaries of nations, I plundered their treasures, like a mighty one I subdued their kings. As one reaches into a nest, so my hand reached for the wealth of the nations. As men gather abandoned eggs, so I gathered all the countries. Not one flapped a wing or opened its mouth to chirp. Does the axe raise itself above the person who swings it, or the saw boast against the one who uses it? As if a rod were to wield against him who lifts it up, or a club brandish him who is not wood. Therefore, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, will send a wasting disease upon his sturdy warriors. Under his pomp, a fire will be kindled like a blazing flame. The light of Israel will become a fire, their holy one a flame in a single day, it will burn and consume his thorns and his briars. The splendor of his forests and fertile fields, it will completely destroy as when a sick person wastes away. And the remaining trees of his forests will be so few that a child could write them down. The remnant of Israel. In that day, the remnant of Israel, the survivors of the house of Jacob, will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return. A remnant of Jacob will return to the mighty God. Though your people, O Israel, be like the sand by the sea, only a remnant will return. Destruction has been decreed, overwhelming and righteous. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, will carry out the destruction decreed upon the whole land. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty, says. My people who live in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians who beat you with a rod and lift up a club against you as Egypt did. Very soon my anger against you will end and my wrath will be directed to their destruction. The Lord Almighty will lash them with a whip as when he struck down Midian at the rock of Oreb, and he will raise his staff over the waters as he did in Egypt. In that day, their burden will be lifted from your shoulders, their yoke from your neck. The yoke will be broken because you have grown so fat. This is the word of the Lord. Let me ask you, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Here's a list of the UK's 10 most common fears. The fear of heights, fear of public speaking, fear of snakes, fear of flying, fear of spiders, fear of crowds, fear of clowns, fear of enclosed spaces, claustrophobia. But you can avoid all those things really if you put your mind to it. You can navigate your way around those fears if, with a little bit of planning. What about things which we can't so easily avoid that do impact all of us? The fear of Brexit uncertainty, 
or fearing for our youth with the increase in serious knife crime, or the fear of terrorism in the capital, fear of continued environmental damage, fear of broken relationships, financial fears, fear of depression or loneliness, fear of unemployment, fear of just anxiety. The more we think about it, there is a lot that can grip us in a sense of fear. If you are trusting the God of the Bible, God says to you, don't be afraid. That's the heart of the message today, and it's found in verse 24. The Lord, the Lord Almighty says, do not be afraid. Whatever the details of your life, God says you need to be reminded of what he is doing on a grand scale And when we see how powerful and loving he is, our fears are put into perspective and we learn to trust him for another day. See, God's people had every reason to be afraid. Let me introduce you to King Sargon, the king of Assyria. Here he is, King Sargon. And in his throne room on the next slide you will see that uh, he, his face is on this winged creature. See, he thought of himself as a king or a god. And here he is, the king in battle fighting a lion. King Sargon took the throne in 721 BC at a time when trouble was breaking out all over the Assyrian Empire. But he squashed all rebellion. And by 710 BC... He had even defeated Babylon. He achieved world dominance uh, that none of the former kings of Assyria had been able to do. He had a city named after himself, and he called himself the Lord of the Universe, or the King of Kings. He was claiming to have godlike power. And you can imagine a world leader with the combined political and military might of the US, China, Iran, and Russia, and it would send fear into the hearts of everyone who heard his name. See, King Sargon already had taken Syria and Israel, and the fall of Judah, with Jerusalem as its capital, looked inevitable. And in verse 7, we see King Sargon's purpose. His purpose is to destroy, to put an end to many nations. See, he thought he was, his army was so strong that his army, his commanders were all like kings. They were that powerful, had so much strength and confidence. See there in verse 8? Are not my commanders all kings? See, they are the superpower, and they knew it. The king's boasting. He's gloating over his triumphs and his victories. And all you need to know about those places mentioned in verse 9, they just show us that the Assyrian king and his army were sweeping from north to south, taking city by city, one after the other, into the empire. And they were heading straight for Jerusalem. They were next. They were plundering everything in their sights. And so the Assyrian king is singing a boastful song in verses 8 to 11. Look at how many times he refers to himself about how great he is. Look with me at verse 10. The Assyrian king says, As my hand uh, has uh, seized the kingdoms. Verse 11, Shall I not deal with Jerusalem as I dwelt with Samaria and her idols? Verse 13, By the strength of my hand I have done this, and by my wisdom because I have understanding. I removed the boundaries of nations. I plundered their treasures. Like a mighty one, I subdued their kings. See, the Assyrian king says invading and taking another city and nation into his empire is as easy for them as plucking an egg from a bird's nest. See that in verse 14? As one reaches into a nest, so my hand reaches for the wealth of the nations. As people gather abandoned eggs, so I gathered all the countries, not one flapping a wing, 
or opened its mouth to chirp. This Assyrian king is so strong and proud, there isn't even a chirp in opposition to him. Fearful power accompanied by breathtaking arrogance. Reminds me a little bit of uh, Muhammad Ali. Remember he, the boxer? And he said, I am the greatest. Such arrogance. But actually at the time, it was clear to see he was the strongest and the greatest. So imagine being in Judah and hearing on the nightly news that King Sargon is heading straight for the city that you live in. You'd be afraid. But God says to his people, do not be afraid. If I was there, I'd be trembling in my boots, thinking this is it. There is no way, not even God can get us out of this predicament. This king is too strong. We're all going to be totally destroyed. Fast forward uh, centuries uh, from King Sargon's time, just to a few years ago, and think about people who would have heard on the news night after night, day after day, of a new regime a ter- with a terrifying ideology sweeping into town across Syria and Iraq. And they would have heard that they were routinely executing thousands of prisoners from the cities that they captured, crucifying some, beheading others, setting some on fire, raping and torturing women and selling others into slavery. They forced about 3.3 million people into exile. We're not talking about Assyria anymore, but ISIS. And throughout history, you could name countless regimes which struck fear into the hearts of people. But all of them, all of them are consigned to the dustbin of history. And many of those regimes who tried to exterminate God's people failed. God says his people did not need to be afraid. They needed to trust him. He would protect them. Now think of how God has grown his church through much persecution in countries like Iran and China. Now come back with me to Isaiah 10. And now God speaks. In advance of Assyria arriving on the, on the doorstep of uh, Jerusalem, God speaks. And he says, do not be afraid. See, God is ruling over all events. He is orchestrating them for his purposes. And now we see this uh, mighty military machine of Assyria in a new light. Verse 5, God speaks. Woe to the Assyrians. See, God wants us to know that behind the mighty Assyrian army stands God himself. He is using them as a rod of his anger, the club of his wrath. In other words, they are just part of his sovereign plan. God is using the Assyrians to discipline and to judge his people. So in verse 6, God says, he's in charge of them. Verse 6, I, I send them against a godless nation. I dispatch him against a people who anger me to seize loot and snatch plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets, the rod of my anger, in whose hand is the club of my wrath. So as scary as King Sargon is, he is just an errand boy. The whole Assyrian Empire is just a piece on the chessboard of God's sovereign plan, just being used to teach and to refine God's people. Do not be afraid. God is in control. Even when the Assyrian Empire floods into the land and tries to destroy them, still God is in control. Isaiah spent nine chapters exposing the sin of God's people and why God has reason to judge them. 
reason to be angry with them. He was like a father to them, but they spurned his love. But God is in control. His hand is orchestrating all things. And here in the scriptures, really for the first time, very, very clearly, we see the divine sovereignty of God and the human responsibility that we all have. Here in the Bible, we're being shown that while God is sovereign over all things, there is still human responsibility. See, God is not evil, but God can even use evil people to accomplish his purposes. But this doesn't re uh, reduce human responsibility. God says true wisdom is understanding who holds the rod. True wisdom is fearing and obeying the one who holds the rod, not the rod itself. See, God's hand is behind uh, the actions of the Assyrians. But they are responsible for their actions. See that in verse 12? When the Lord has finished all his work, his work of using Assyria to judge and refine his people, then he says, I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look in his eyes. See, God hated the arrogant pride of his people, Israel, and now he hates the arrogant pride of the Assyrians. And verse 13, God says, for the king of Assyria says, well, I've done this in my own strength. But God says, no, 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 King Sargon, no, I've given you the strength to accomplish my will, to administer the judgment that I have set out. And so God puts some simple but profound questions forward for us to think about in verse 15. Does the axe raise itself above the person who swings it? Or the saw boast against the one who uses it? As if a rod were to wield the person who lifts it up, or a club brandish the one who is not wood? They're rhetorical questions. The answer is no, of course not. Just as the human being is always in charge of the object, so God is always in charge of all events across the whole world. In all the work of the Lord, verse 16, he says, The Lord, the Lord Almighty, will now send a wasting disease upon his sturdy warriors. Under his pomp, a fire will be kindled like a blazing flame. The light of Israel will become a fire, their holy one a flame. In a single day, it will burn and consume his thorns and his briars. The splendor of his forests and fertile fields, it will completely destroy as when a sick person wastes away, and the remaining trees of his forests will be so few that a child could write them down. God is saying he will now judge the Assyrian army. He will protect his people. And if you read further on into Isaiah in chapter 37, we see this happening. When the Assyrian army is on the outskirts, on the doorstep of Jerusalem, and they think they're going to sweep in and take control and pluck another city into the empire. The angel of the Lord slays 185,000 Assyrians overnight. And the king withdraws back to Nineveh. And he's actually killed by his two sons. And just as the Lord sent the Assyrians in Isaiah's day, so he uses various trials and uncomfortable situations on his people today in order to uh, work out his purposes. And his great work in his people is to refine them, to keep a remnant, to keep a people who truly look to his ways and want to live for him with love and affection, the love and affection that he has showered upon them, he wants to humble us and make us return to him and live with him joyfully. That's why God says, do not be afraid. 
God is teaching us to rely on him throughout all the circumstances of our lives and on the big scale across the nation, across the world. God is teaching us in all things to rely on him. He is the sovereign Lord with all power, controlling all events throughout all of history. And he says to his people, do not be afraid. Now, as Christians, we know that God is in control. We know that in our head. But living by faith and trusting God's promise is actually much harder to do day by day. See, we very quickly slip into being afraid and trying to fix things ourselves, trusting our own abilities and our own strength. Isaiah chapters 1 to 10 have been written for us to humble us. And some of us over the past weeks have been humbled as we've grappled with the issues that Isaiah has been communicating to us. And for those of us who have been humbled, the Lord wants you to know today that you do not need to be afraid. He is growing you. He is refining you. But for those of us who haven't yet been humbled by what God has been teaching us, you need to perhaps reread the first 10 chapters of Isaiah and take note of how God humbled Israel and then Assyria. And we need to know that the best thing that God can do for us is actually to humble us so that we learn to truly rely on him and be reassured of his power to overrule all the events of the whole world. And you could think Isaiah could have said that in just a couple of sentences. But God speaks to us in a way that we can understand daily. And he asks us to put our faith into practice. He told us, That if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. And so each and every day is a day that we are being asked to actively trust the sovereign Lord who is in control, who says, do not be afraid, but follow me. And if you think, well, all that happened so long ago, what has God done to prove himself now? Well, Isaiah 10 at the end reminds us that what God has done in the past, he still does today. And we look at the example of God rescuing his people from slavery in Egypt miraculously. And we say they did not need to fear. The Lord went before them. We look at the example of Gideon defeating the opponents in in Midian. And we said God miraculously rescued his people. And wonderfully, we look to the example of the Lord Jesus Christ and his defeat, his defeat of our most fearsome enemy of sin and death. And as we see him hanging on the cross, exclaiming, it is finished, and rising to new life. That is the assurance that his people have today, that he is alive And he has promised to be with us. And he is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. And he has promised to come back. To have for himself a people who truly trust him. Who truly walk in the splendor of his majesty. Not being afraid of what the world throws at us. But humbly walking beside our maker. Joyful that he is protecting us and shielding us. From our greatest enemy. What are you afraid of? Actually, we've found out from Isaiah 10 if we're not trusting in Jesus, our greatest fear needs to be God Himself because He will judge. But His judgment is merciful, 
And he wants us to follow him. He wants us to be humbled. He wants us, with true obedience, to come and lay our lives before him and say, thank you, Jesus, that God's judgment fell on him and it will not fall on us. And so we can joyfully say, I will not fear because the Lord is on my side. Jesus says this himself in Matthew chapter 10. He says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Jesus has lifted the burden from our shoulders. He has lifted the yoke of slavery from us. He has restored us to health in his name. He says, do not be afraid. Trust. Trust in him. Walk by faith in the God of promises who has acted throughout history and who is clear that he is coming back again and he will reign on the throne of heaven for all eternity. He is the one we should fear. But when we trust in Jesus, he is the one who welcomes us into the Father's house. So this week, when fears are tempted to rise up in your hearts, Remember the Sovereign Lord is in control of all things. Remember that Jesus has dealt with our biggest problem of sin and death. And we don't need to be afraid of anything because he is with us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that this morning you have reminded us that we do not need to be afraid that you have promised to keep a remnant of people that will far outnumber the stars in the sky. You are gathering your people in from all nations, not because of our intelligence or anything found within us, but simply because Jesus has set us free from a yoke of slavery to sin and death. And he is the one we look to for our joy and our security. Father, cause faith to rise in our church family today so we that may live for your praise and glory this week. Amen.